Hi, my name is Bogdan. I'm a professor at Politenka University of Timisoara, and I'm presenting Canary, our joint work with colleagues from the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. So we are no longer strangers to the fact that cars may have dozens or even more than a hundred issues that run several million lines of code to ensure various functionalities. Obviously, these issues need to communicate, and while there are many options for implementing in-vehicle buses ranging from low to high speeds, the CAN bus is still the most widely used. Why is this the case? Mostly because of its simplicity, low cost, and effectiveness proven by more than three decades of use. Newer embodiments such as CANFD and CANXL boost its speed from 1 megabit per second to 5 or even 10 megabits per second and prove that this bus is here to stay. The CAN bus is a differential bus, which uses two lines, CAN high and CAN low, connected via 120 ohm terminal resistors that are specifically important for the development in this world. The bus has two states, a recessive state where the two CAN lines have the same voltage level and a dominant state in which they differ by about two volts. The dominant state of the bus is able to override the recessive state. This type of physical air will allow two nodes to start broadcasting at the same time. And since the dominant voltage will override the recessive voltage, the node that writes the ID with the lower value will be allowed to continue writing on the bus, while the rest of the nodes will lose the arbitration. The frame will carry only 64 bits, but this is generously extended to 64 bytes in the newer embodiment CANFD. Nevertheless, and again important from this work, the CAN bus has a nice error confinement mechanism by which nodes that introduce error on the bus or which encounter receive errors will go into an error passive state and ultimately in a bus off state that prevents them from further disturbing the bus. The lack of security on CAN led to many attacks reported in the recent years. Currently, we know that cars are insecure as we see papers reporting vulnerabilities each year. The more relevant part related to security is that both the industry and the research community were quick to react with security designs. The industry had proposed standards, such as the AutoSAR standard for secure onboard communication, and the research community proposed extremely creative approaches to secure CAN buses. Notably, most of these creative efforts stem from the limited payload of 64 bits in CAN frames, which makes it very difficult to embed security elements. So there have been many proposals for truncated MACs, mixing MACs, encrypting or authenticating the ID field, which is also claimed to offer some DOS resilience. And other solutions have called to physical properties of the bus and controllers, using clock skews, voltage levels, or even cover timing or voltage channels. Now, regardless of this previously described security mechanism, there is one attack that is impossible to stop on CAN buses, that is denial of service attacks. The reason why this is impossible is because of the physical layer and error confinement mechanism. So one way to cause a DOS is by simply modifying a frame during transmission, which will cause transmission errors and will make the sender going to bus off. Another way is by simply flooding the bus with high priority frames, or even simpler than that, keep the bus in a dominant state, which will make it impossible for other nodes to communicate. It is clear that these issues are due to intrinsic properties of the physical layer, and they cannot be prevented by traditional security mechanisms. For this purpose, in Canary, we took an entirely distinct approach. We had a bus guardian that monitors the left and right ends of the bus. The bus guardian will run some intrusion detection mechanism. In our work, we rely on a simple bloom filtering that checks for known identifier or fixed frame content, as well as check for the arrival rate of frames and verify that it does not exceed the specific threshold, which will signal a flooding attack. Of course, any other IDS can be implemented at the bus guardian level, but this is a topic in its own and will be out of scope for the current communication. Once an intrusion is detected, the bus guardian will disconnect segments of the bus in an attempt to localize and isolate the intrusion. The question is, how do we disconnect bus segments without damaging the transmission? We cannot simply cut the wires. For this, we introduce a simple engineering tool, which we call in what follows the bus scannery. The bus scanner is a double relay resistor structure that will allow bus disconnections at any point on the bus without losing the 120 ohm end of line impedance. So for example, in the picture below, you can see that the canary between ACU2 and ACU3, when switching from position one to position two, will simply split the bus into two sub buses while keeping a 120 ohm impedance constant at the end of the lines. The full schematic of our experimental model can be seen below. One canary is placed in the vicinity of each issue, and the bus guardian will monitor the left and right ends of the bus 
making it possible to split the bus and yet retransmit from one part to the other such that communication is never lost. Below, you can see the actual implementation of Henry in our work. We use the powerful automotive grade controller Infineon Tricor for the bus guardian and some simple cheap electromagnetic relays that require a five volt power supply. The adversary model considered by our work envisions three types of adversaries according to their position on the bus. The first type of adversary is an adversary that will tap the bus or compromise a unit in a position where it can be completely isolated. Type two adversaries tap the bus in a location that cannot be completely isolated, but the issue nearby has non-essential functionalities and can be isolated along with the adversary. Finally, type three adversaries will tap the bus in a location where it is not possible to isolate them nor is it possible to lose functionality in that part of the bus, for which we will use a load balancing mechanism to prevent the attack. Here is a concrete example of type one adversary, which taps the bus between two relays and can be fully isolated and then traffic can be redirected from one side to the other. Next, there is a type two adversary that can only be isolated with issue one, but we can still filter and redirect traffic from the compromised side. And finally, here is an example of type three adversary, which we cannot isolate and cannot lose communications on either the left or right side of the network, but we can load balance the adversary from the left to the right by triggering relays three and four, filtering and redirecting traffic from one side to the other. To prove functionalities, we use two test beds. The first of them uses traffic collected from a real vehicle. We then port this traffic in our laboratory test bed where we split it and replay it at the two bus ends, attempting to isolate the type three adversary in the middle of the bus. The solution proves highly effective. As you can see, when the adversary is causing a DOS, the bus load increases to 400 kilobits per second on either the left or on the right side, but not on both sides of the bus at the same time. During the DOS, only a few legitimate frames denoted as blue dots will enter the channel and high priority adversarial frames denoted as orange dots will be more prevalent. Notice that the left and right channels are asynchronous as the adversary is switched from one side to the other. There are three important questions regarding the effectiveness of canary. One of them is what happens with transmissions during the time when the relays are triggered. Well, these relays have a five millisecond operation time, but the bus disturbances will last about one millisecond based on our measurement. As you can see in this oscilloscope plot, the frame that is sent during the relay action will be destroyed and the sender will get a transmission error. But due to the clever design of CAN, it will retransmit the frame as soon as the bus regains its recessive level. The second question is what happens to error counters? Fortunately, as the node continues retransmissions as soon as the bus recovers to the recessive state, the error counter will be decremented on successful retransmission. In our experiments, even with a fast relay triggering rate of once every 100 milliseconds, the Tekken red counters did not exceed 50, which keeps the node in the error active state. With a lower one second relay triggering rate, the situation is even better. Finally, the nodes are not even closer to the error passive state, and there is no chance that they will go into a bus off state. The third question is what delays are caused by relays on legitimate frames? Well, they encounter only slight delays, as you can see in this plot. The left plot shows the arrival time on the left channel, which is the source of the frame. And the right plot shows the arrival rate on the right channel where the frames are retransmitted. You can see that only several of the 30,000 frames in these experiments have delays of 10 milliseconds. Finally, the histogram distribution shows that the average arrival time is mostly unchanged on the two channels. Our second test bed, takes advantage of an existing simulation from the Canoe tool. The Canoe tool is an industry standard tool and notably this simulation environment was previously used more than a decade ago to perform some of the first reported attacks on the CAN bus. In the simulation, we have five CAN IDs responsible for various engine gearbox and ABS functions. You can see that when a DOS takes place, communication is completely lost. With 500 milliseconds load balancing, the signals recover, and although there are visible distortions, the car remains functional in our simulation. Finally, at 50 millisecond load balancing, there is no visible distortion of the signals. Here is some action. You can see that with the relay triggers, the signals which were previously lost now recover, but distortions are still visible. Next, with a faster relay rate, the signals will start to look almost perfect and there are no visible distortions. This is mostly what we have tested so far 
and there is obvious some room for improvements. For example, we can use much faster solid state relays that have an operation time of under one millisecond. We can also use more relays on the bus, but care must be taken since wiring may become prohibitive and the number of placements grows exponentially. Also, more complex scenarios with multiple adversaries may be considered. So far, we used only one adversary in our work, which we assume to be realistic for in vehicle networks, but more adversaries may be considered as well. As a conclusion, our work introduces bus scanneries, a double relay resistor structure that allows dynamic architectural changes. Please note that we do not change the bus topology of CAN. We just split the bus into two or more sub buses that are perfectly compliant to the CAN standard. We do some architectural changes, but we try to do them in a creative way. We try to think differently about CAN buses and rethink them for modern security needs. Retrofitting is a key aspect of our work. Remember those car alarms, GPS navigations, or Android head units that can add modern functionalities to old cars. Based on the slightly modified CAN bus architecture from this work, we set room for intruder localization and more important for intruder isolation, which was never addressed before. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have questions, please drop me an email. Bye.